When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. This week... We're back, and we're going to talk about how to write and watch a movie in the age of all of this. But first, some big news. We thought and talked a lot about your survey feedback and decided to make it way easier to, one, get the news, and two, read or listen to the essays. These things. How? We're going to split them up. So starting next week, the schedule and formats, for email at least, will be Monday, the newsletter the news, uh, the actual news, a potpourri of action steps, can't miss features from the good shit and some other sections we've got going on, all consumable in five minutes or less. Friday will be the weekly essay, this thing, plus relevant action steps. And that's it. It'll be a focused deep read or listen for your weekend. But for now, let's get to it. I'm Quinn Emmett, and this is important, not important, science for people who give a shit. You can hit subscribe right now to get this essay and newsletter and my conversations with the world's smartest people every single week. You can also find the email version and links to everything at importantnotimportant.com or write in your show notes. It is Friday, August 25th, 2023. Here are your weekly action steps. The first, donate to Experiment, a platform where scientists can crowdfund their research and you can pick and choose what research you want to support. Number two, volunteer with our friends at the Environmental Voter Project. I love these guys. It is a nonpartisan, nonprofit with a proven track record of getting non-voting environmentalists to the polls. Number three, get educated about climate change and combat disinformation with Climate Feedback, which is a worldwide network of scientists sorting fact from fiction in climate change media coverage. And last, Be heard about climate action and keep your representative accountable by checking out uh, the list of candidates on our site and elected officials that have signed the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge. Oh, last one. I was wrong. Invest in deforestation-free companies by moving your money into investments that aren't killing the planet with deforestation-free funds. And now for today's essay. My kid wants to watch Jaws. Now, forgetting for a brief moment my more or less incalculable angst at how quickly my children are growing up. I am, on the one hand, elated to finally be on the cusp of sharing some of my favorite adult movies uh, with my kids. So, on the other, his request prompted an interesting discussion between us where I had to explain how different Jaws is from other scary classics like um, Jurassic Park, stuff he's already watched. Now, sure, there's some pretty obvious similarities between those two examples. For example, both films feature people being eaten alive, but differently. In both films, humans insert themselves into a food chain where they are not the alpha and they do not belong. Uh, Both are iconic movies. Both are adapted from novels. uh, They have different screenwriters, but they're directed by the same iconic director, one of my favorites, using many of the same cinematic styles and tools like Alien uh, not fully revealing the bad guy until well into the movie, right? Um, But there are also a ton of differences between them. And in talking them over and over and over with an impatient, skeptical 10-year-old, it reminded me just how much intentions matter and how much the intended audience matters and how when you get it right, it can change the world. Intentions, intended audiences, messages, lessons, carefully calibrated for maximum effect. 
are what make the bodies that pile up in the cold open shootout in Star Wars A New Hope different from the ones on Omaha Beach in something like Saving Private Ryan. Knowing your audience is what makes the Emperor's fictional stormtroopers different from Hitler's real-life stormtroopers. It's what makes a revived T-Rex uh, different than an ancient real Jaws. At the right age, it'll definitely give you nightmares, but the first situation simply will not happen to you. You have less than zero odds of being ripped off a toilet by a T-Rex or blasted by force lightning by a Sith Lord. But the latter situation, Jaws, could very well happen to you because the oceans are real and so are sharks. And at some point in your life, you will probably go into the ocean. And because sharks actively, if relatively rarely, eat people because they have been around for hundreds of millions of years and we are just the next soft, delicious treat to wander into the waves. But again, he's 10 years old. And in trying to explain these things to him, I thought about how much deeper a movie like Jaws can intentionally be because the intended audience is supposedly more capable of deeper lessons. On the surface, get it? Uh, Jaws doesn't seem to want to say as much about us and our choices as something like uh, The Wire or Parasite. But look deeper, and you can see a story about fatherhood and responsibility, about the middle class, about the power of local government, about corrupt politicians uh, in the time of Nixon, or, it turns out, if you're Fidel Castro, about a heroic great white shark absolutely laying waste to American capitalism. True story. As with most art, your mileage may vary, which is the point. For my 10-year-old, most of that doesn't apply yet. So my final argument to him eventually was simplified. I said something along the lines of this. I am happy and eager to share Jaws with you. But I really, really need you to understand. You are a person that loves the ocean, who spent eight hours riding the waves last week. And once you see Jaws, you cannot unsee it. Despite what you believe I'm capable of as your father, which will diminish over time, I will not be able to turn back the clock on this thing, to undo what has done, and help you make a different choice once the credits begin to roll. Like many millions before you who have seen Jaws and eventually gone back into the water, you will eventually be fine. But probably not at first. You'll be haunted by questions like, what's scarier, murky water or clear water? Things like, are there freshwater river sharks? And are we sure there's no sharks in lakes? I mean, how would they get even get in, right? Uh, and what about pools? Of, of course, there's no shark in the deep end of this community pool. Uh, right? Right? Now look. The best movies and TV stick with you. They reframe your perspective. They open your mind to an experience outside of, or long before, your own. The first five minutes of Up are nearly as traumatic in a very different way as any episode of Band of Brothers, two intended, two very different audiences. Finding Nemo and Coco do vitally important work at an important age to gently introduce lessons about loss and family and the long tail of grief, something I wrestle with. Barbie goes hard at the patriarchy, at sexism, and more. Wally -E is one of the most romantic movies of all time, set in a world destroyed by capitalism and convenience and consumerism, starring a nearly wordless robot who believes in us more than we ever did, who is committed to getting up every day and doing the work to make the world a better place. Hayao Miyazaki's movies, which I was super late to, say so much about protecting our relationship with the environment around us, not just the environment itself, of which, of course, we're part of. They talk about gratitude and kindness and purpose. He said, Many of my movies have strong female leads, brave, self-sufficient girls that don't think twice about fighting for what they believe with all their heart. They'll need a friend or a supporter, but never a savior. Any woman is just as capable of being a hero as any man. Still, it's not uncommon to walk out of a movie and wonder what exactly the writer and director 
and producers and editors and VFX people and costumers and makeup wanted to say, what they wanted us to take away from their years of work. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes the message is pretty personal. Sometimes it's right on the nose. Sometimes it's subtle and or complex. Let's go back to Jaws. 48 years, Jesus, after Jaws came out, I think it's clear Steven Spielberg didn't really have anything against the ocean specifically, but he spent many of the in-between years exploring his dad issues, sometimes subtly and other times less so. With Jaws, at least, dads do actually feature pretty heavily, but he also pretty simply wanted to scare the shit out of you with a real-life scenario. He's talked recently about wanting to go back to those kinds of movies. Spielberg didn't direct Jaws 2, but the tagline says it all, just when you thought he was safe to go back in the water. That's pretty grounded. And it couldn't be more different than the famous one, A Long Time Ago in a Land Far, Far Away, or another one of my all-time favorites, You'll Believe a Man Can Fly, from Superman 1978. Really different, right? Intentionally different. Now, I want to be clear. I love stuff like Dumb and Dumber. I love Schitt's Creek and cooking shows. I watch a lot of stuff that's not movies and stuff. I watch baseball and soccer. There's plenty of movies and TV intentionally designed to take your mind off of the world around us for just a couple hours. And believe me when I say that's a lot of my programming these days. But going back to the point, cinema and television, and where they have often been blurred over the past 20 years, they have this long history of intentionally making something you have to see and making it so well and so timely and so vitally important and so brutally honest that you also can't unsee it. Again, that is the point. Think of Jaws. Think of Band of Brothers and Saving Private Ryan. But also Glory, 9 to 5, Schindler's List, Parasite, Get Out, Hustlers, Moonlight, His Girl Friday, Children of Men, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, The Wire, MASH, uh, Pose, Steven Universe, I May Destroy You, The Handmaid's Tale, and so many more. The point is for you to know and to understand something vitally important, as much as you can from one movie or show. And maybe, maybe, we, the audience, will take just enough away from those stories and characters to make different choices in the real world. That's it. That's action. That's where we are. And I truly believe that's the power of film and TV and books. That's a different essay. Here's another quote for you. Certain things leave you in your life and certain things stay with you. And that's why we're all interested in movies. Those ones that make you feel you still think about. Because it gave you such an emotional response, it's actually part of your emotional makeup in a way. And that's from Tim Burton. So I spend the vast majority of my time here explaining that our huge intersecting systems are simply choices we've made. And our mostly inequitable problems are the results of those choices. The great news, as always, is we can make different choices. We have to make different ones. We get to make different ones. What a privilege, right? We have these enormous problems. But as they're mostly of our own making, even if they're getting a little out of hand, and because we have so much evidence about how much good we can do, look at infant mortality, look at childhood mortality, look at poverty. We have so much evidence of what we can do across people and across time. Our problems are actually inspirational as hell to me and tens of thousands of you all. Think of those revelatory movies now and TV that urge us to persevere, uh, sometimes through a slightly more hopeful tone. Personally, like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Rocky, Inside Out, Elf, uh, Thelma and Louise, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Paddington 2, uh, Home Before Dark, E.T., Chariots of Fire, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Moana. Think of the quote uh, from Garnet and Steven Universe. All comedy is derived from fear. Let's go back to war for a moment. Saving Private Ryan isn't just a, isn't, it's not a short film, however you want to define it. It's not just about those first 20 minutes, the absolute graphic in-your-face horror of you're going to watch and remember how 54 years ago, almost 200,000 people walked 
swam, jumped onto the meat grinder beaches of Normandy, France. That was 54 years ago from when it came out, of course. Now it's a thousand years later. The real horror wasn't actually what they did that day. It was why they had to do D-Day. The horror was what might happen if my grandparents' generation didn't risk it all. And the same goes in a much less epic presentation uh, by the same director for uh, a real-life person and, and character uh, like Oscar Schindler, as one example. So they did risk it all. And that effort, that risk, that transformation, the journey is where the beauty is. It's the choices they made. That's where the story is. That's where the impact is made. 200,000 people from across the US and UK and other allied countries, a small fraction of the tens of millions of allied troops who were eventually mobilized throughout the war, including again, both of my grandfathers, many of whom would die in the coming days and weeks and months. They signed up or were drafted to basically be shredded that day by beachgoing Nazis because some of them would get through. Because that's simply what it had come to. It's what we had to do, and it was worth the risk. It is horrific, still, of course, and heroic and hopeful at the same time. Look at what we can do if we have to, if we decide to, however ugly it may be. And look, there are a gazillion reasons why we keep making movies about World War II and the people who fought in it. Because they're beautiful, and it reminds us over and over that we have faced make-or-break moments before, even if we got ourselves into them. And it reminds us what we are capable of. Now, in full disclosure, look around here. I'm talking to you from inside uh, sustainably produced board shorts um, at my standing desk, usually over there at this one, next to a sustainable heat pump. I've got organic cold brew out of my reusable clean canteen from our store. I mean, besides e-biking to work in poorly marked bike lanes across my leafy college town, I have risked nothing today. The point is, we are often presented with the opportunity to do the hard thing, to put our thumb on the scale of history, however risky it may be, and however much we do truly, viscerally fear that risk. So bodies on Normandy Beach or Jews hidden in the attic are among the most utilized stories and remembered stories for a reason, because it's always worth another reminder. But those aren't the only stories we have told and have to keep telling. We have to make the Underground Railroad and 12 Years a Slave and Lincoln and The Color Purple, because it's really, really important we don't forget how we got there to that point, and then what we did to try to change it. And also because we're still clearly struggling to live up to the myth of America, because the same people are still suffering at the hands of power systems that don't operate too differently from those 200 years ago. Now we've got touch screens and GPS. As a movie like Lincoln shows, it was eventually very clear to half of us what we had to do then even if doing it couldn't erase what had transpired here for 246 years, and even if it required enormous sacrifice to do it, even if it would never be enough. But like I said before, a movie like Saving Private Ryan doesn't stop after the first 20 minutes, and like most ambitious art, it's about so much more than its setting or the inciting incident, as they call it. So let's dive into that for just a sec. If you're unfamiliar, the film's actually mostly about what happens immediately after D-Day. A platoon of American soldiers is ordered to risk their own lives to retrieve another soldier they don't know, some guy they do not know, from some distant battlefield in Europe before he can be killed. What? Why? Well, it's revealed that that guy's three brothers were all killed in action at Omaha Beach. And despite everything else, Four for Four Brothers dead was not a sacrifice the lightly fictionalized George C. Marshall was willing to accept. So these few guys, otherwise ordinary young men, reluctantly take the job under this sort of unknowable vanilla captain. And over their journey, increasingly and understandably, though, 
becoming brothers in arms themselves along the way and being picked off one by one along the way, they start to operate with something like uh, bitter jealousy at what they have to do here. Even Tom Hanks, playing this stoic captain of theirs, wonders sometimes how this one man, Private Ryan, could be worth so much. And he says, he better be worth it. He better go home and cure a disease or invent a longer lasting light bulb. That's for Captain Miller, Tom Hanks' character, who's also a high school English teacher and a baseball coach. The secret, though, is there's no one main character to defeating evil or to radical progress. It was never just about Lincoln. There's no personal versus systemic. I hate that shit. Patton didn't win the war. Churchill didn't win the war. Anne Frank's diary didn't suddenly turn the tide of the war. Millions of people acting towards the same goal from Pearl Harbor to Stalingrad to Australia won the war. We chose to do impossible things then because either everyone else was or because no one else was. We did them because if we didn't, someone somewhere was going to keep suffering much more than we ever would, or even more people would eventually suffer. And eventually, now, at this moment, we had to try to finally stop it. And if we could, to reverse it, to build something even safer and better. And we remember what our ancestors did because we choose to keep telling those stories. That's what humans have done forever. The best time to plant a tree was yesterday. The best time to punch a Nazi is all of the time. And it's always, always the perfect moment to share stories of what we've done to protect one another, to share stories that have never been told before from perspectives that have never been shared before about real life heroes we've never seen before. And this is key to imagine what else we could do in the time to come from now from figuring out how to just build trains and make malaria vaccines uh, to finding a cure for Alzheimer's and glorifying teaching so that maybe we'll make it a well-paying job. We have to make movies and TV about what we can do together to bring to life something better. Right? Here's another quote for you. I just want to tell good stories in ways that will shine a light on lives rarely seen on screen because stories can push humanity forward. And that's director Nia DaCosta. I write and podcast, right, from a place of enormous privilege. I have this world-class education, uh, health, money, a computer, a microphone, the internet, these lights. I have relationships and I have scientists and investors and elected officials on call. I have all of you. And now at the turn of the tide, when the chips are down and the future lies wide open in front of us, I use them to make a blog and a podcast, which is not the same thing as operating, say, a submarine or a TBM Avenger fighter plane like my grandfather's did. Regardless, even these tools give me historically enormous leverage to help bend the needle. Now, some more context on why I thought about this today. Years ago, I embarked on my third or fourth career, this time as a Hollywood screenwriter and producer, where it's rumored you are statistically more likely to play in an NFL game than to get one of your screenplays made. It's pretty tough, and it's getting tougher. Now, that's all still actually ongoing. Though you may have heard, we're currently on strike. And delightfully, I'm increasingly finding more opportunities to marry that work with my work here. To not only support the people who are suffering on the front lines of climate change or without health care or food or both, but also the people who are working on the front lines of the future, and they're often necessarily the same people, by the way, to invent a new future, uh, to distribute a new future and make it accessible to everyone this time. Here's another quote for you. Words have more power than any one can guess. It is by words that the world's great fight, now in these civilized times, is carried on. I never hesitated to use them when I fought any battle for the miserable and oppressed. People are so afraid to speak. It would seem as if half our fellow creatures were born with deficient organs, 
Like parrots, they can repeat a lesson, but their voice fails them, when that alone is wanting to make the tyrant quail. And that is by Mary Shelley. We have to tell these stories. We have to tell more stories like this, because this is another version of what I call compound action. We shit-givers and millions more before and after us, we are not the first to do this by any stretch. We build on their shoulders and all their work before us. We have to do the work in real life like they did and they continue to do. And then masterful storytellers, not me, tell the stories of how we all did it. So more people understand what we do and what we're capable of together. So that even more people later, stretched across time, are inspired by and directly benefit from that real life work and the cleaner, healthier world it provides. And so even better and more representative storytellers can come along and recount in cinematic glory what happened here and why. What the struggle was like, what we overcame, the very real bad guys standing in our way. And how fucking incredible it felt to have bent the needle towards progress just a bit more. Of course, side note, if we have any hope of these stories seeing the screen, writers and actors need to be paid a living wage and to be compensated fairly when the most popular films and shows, stories that would not have existed had they not put pen to paper or showed up in front of the camera, when these become hits or even cultural touchstones. And you are welcome and encouraged to apply these same conditions to the VFX artists, the animators, the below-the-line workers, the truck drivers, and so many more who bring the words to life on screen. And this is all especially true for historically marginalized writers, who are almost always the most marginalized groups in open society, who are the keepers of our untold stories. I mean, do you think it's some wild coincidence that black mothers in America are three to four times as likely to die in or after childbirth, and that across 1,600 of the best performing films of the last 16 years, across 1,600 films, just 15 were directed by black women? And we can tell stories about the people we know working to slow the climate crisis on the front lines of COVID, about pregnancy and motherhood and fatherhood, about the oceans, about our soil, our skies, and wind and trees. We also have to work so much harder to unlock the systems to make sure people are able to tell their own stories. Here's another quote for you. If you have the opportunity for your art to meet activism, you shouldn't pass that up when it comes your way. And that's Regina King. So no, we can't just keep telling the same World War II stories. We have to tell stories about the real-life women who operated essential spy rings during World War I and World War II. Women who seduced and lured Nazis out of taverns into the dark woods to be quietly slaughtered one by one. About the black men fighting for freedom abroad for a country that wouldn't give it to them at home. And you can rinse and repeat that for the Civil War, again for COVID, for wildfires, for hurricanes, for the youths currently winning in court on climate. About small town community health clinics, about teachers and children, about farmers and soil and mental health, about the ocean, about fighting for basic necessities. Here's a quote for you. The men need shoes, Colonel. And that's from the character John Rawlins uh, in Glory. Like how Saving Private Ryan finally brought to life D-Day in a way that uh, The Longest Day could only dream of. Movies and shows like Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and Booksmart and Hustlers stand on the shoulders of 9 to 5 and Tootsie. These devastatingly specific art with a timeless, broadly applicable message, which is Shit is hard. It doesn't have to be this way. We can and should do better, but it'll take all of us. Here's another quote. It's what my father always told me, that if I ever tried to make something of myself, that no man would want me. And so, I mean, just like the minute that I try to pursue my dreams, my husband accidentally falls into another woman's vagina. Obviously, that's from Paula Proctor from Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, a show you should definitely watch. Some more context. I'm a proud advisor to the Good Energy Project. And last year, the wonderful people behind it uh, published a playbook where they eloquently described just a few of the stories we could tell 
through drama and comedies and romances and mysteries alike to get more climate onto screen. From the playbook, we're moving past the tropes of dorky do-gooder, angry vegan, and the eco-terrorist villain who prefers his pet cat to the town he's about to blow up. The people who care about climate are real and multidimensional and flawed. Because everybody is having and will have a unique experience of this crisis, every character can be a climate character. They don't have to be climate scientists or activists. Your climate characters could be the young queer person made to feel unsafe in the shelter during a hurricane. The crusading small town lawyer who can't get his antidepressants after a wildfire. The grandmother in a wheelchair stuck on the 10th floor when the elevator goes out in a heat wave power outage. The neurodivergent teen who finds community in a green tech class. They're your roommate stripping as a side gig to fund their new nonprofit. A couple wrestling with whether to have kids. A teen skipping school to strike with his crush. The grad student struggling with panic attacks. A conservative farmer from Georgia witnessing escalating storms decimate his peach crops, profits, and spirit. An auntie who becomes a solar engineer. The Sierra Club lobbyist racking up frequent flyer miles because of their long-distance relationship. The Latino preacher who takes on the coal plant, suffocating his neighborhood. A young oil rig worker enduring an existential crisis. A grassroots activist secretly longing for a pedicure and a martini. They're neglectful parents or alcoholics or people struggling with depression. They're the school jock or theater nerd. The secret authors of fan fiction, the manager of their dog's TikTok, their humanity is genuine, as is their concern and courage and passion. Not everyone can or should be Greta Thunberg, but most climate characters will be everyday people instead, the kind we recognize from our own lives. You can check out the rest of that playbook and all their resources at uh, the website in your show notes. But the point is, we can and should tell these stories to not only share what is being done to so many by actual fucking bad guys, but also to show and share how we can help, where we can do better, what's working. And that's why I will keep showing my kids films and TV they can't unsee to not only contextualize and check their own privilege, but so they're inspired to put it to use. I can't unsee Selma, but I also can't unsee The Good Place, not because they're anything alike, except in asking big questions about how I should be spending my very limited time on this rock. We keep making and watching movies and TV we can't unsee because they move us so steadfastly to go out and do real shit. Here's a quote from Emma Riley Adams at the New York Times just this week. It's a tough brief, making an eco-focused movie that people want to watch, while also inspiring engagement with an issue that feels too intractable to face. Yet a new genre is emerging, the environmental action film or eco-thriller that addresses the conundrum of climate anxiety by applying the tropes of a heist flick to the mission of curbing the consumption of Earth's resources. Such works bring us to the edge of our seats, making us wonder, can these people succeed in securing our future? And then perhaps, can we? Frankly, I don't care if we're talking about versions of real-life people on screen, or we're doing sci-fi or fantasy, or one inspired by the other. You know, Frodo doesn't exist on paper or screen if Tolkien didn't have some serious World War I baggage to work out. Whatever moves the needle, let's use it. Here's a quote from you from one of my favorite characters. Live now. Make now always the most precious time. Now will never come again. That is, of course, from Jean-Luc Picard from Star Trek The Next Generation and, and others. We can make movies and shows for kids and ones for adults, and those beautiful four-quadrant movies for the whole family, whatever your family looks like. I encourage you to write and, and produce and direct and, and work on and watch movies for the people in your family who are already terrified to go into the basement alone, written by one of the greatest horror actors of all time, like Jamie Lee Curtis is doing. In any version, whatever the intended audience, however action-packed or romantic or both, make something Watch something we can't unsee. Make movies, see movies, write books and poems and short stories. Produce historical fiction or satire or both. Here's the last quote for you. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. 
That's President Merkin Muffley from Dr. Strangelove. So yeah, man, you can start your kids and nieces and whatever your charge is with dinosaurs and clownfish and robots. You can move up to sharks like I'm going to when they're damn sure they're ready. And to be clear, they're not. And then you can start doing things like uh, movies like Remember the Titans. And eventually you'll, you'll find your way to uh, Just Mercy and do the right thing. You guys can watch Life is Beautiful and Hidden Figures, Turning Red, The Imitation Game, and 42, uh, The Great Escape. Uh, you can watch A League of Their Own, The Hate You Give, Abbott Elementary, and, and so much more. There's so much more out there. And if it inspires you to do real shit, do the work with us today here. And maybe someday someone will tell your story. That's it for this week. You can hit subscribe to get next week's uh, issue straight to our feed. To go deeper, visit importantnotimportant.com. Thank you for being a part of our community. And thanks for giving a shit. Have a great weekend.